On June 30th, 2007, after 54 years in operation, Selenese closed its petrochemical plant in Northeast Edmonton. It was a sad day for workers at a plant that, in its heyday, employed more than 1,000 workers at this site. But it was not an isolated closing. Firms that add value to Alberta's resources are rapidly disappearing. In recent years, Edmonton alone has lost all its meatpacking plants, Molson's, GWG, and Selenese, among others. We used to have a, a lot of good paying manufacturing jobs in Canada. We're gradually losing them. So we're ending up with a lot of uh, jobs just in retail trades and they're not jobs that pay enough for people to make a living at. So you find people running around working two or three jobs. We have entered a phase of capitalism, sometimes called globalization, in which companies feel no allegiance to communities. Assets are stripped and shipped abroad with one touch of a computer key. It is the responsibility of government to preserve and extend our value-added industries. Selene shut down because of free trade and the U.S. buying it out. We were just a little plant in the sticks, in the boondocks, and you're going to shut down Texas or you're going to shut down Edmonton? Well, what's your choice? You shut down Edmonton. Selene's Edmonton was a large, integrated, highly profitable operation which added considerable value to petrochemical feedstock. A good amount of the value of the resource and the value added stayed in Edmonton. In fact, it was a pillar of an economic strategy which invested in long-term, stable, productive capacity. There was a lot of natural gas in Alberta and it was stranded gas. And so, it, in effect, what it did was built a two-price system for gas and it made it very economically viable to build a petrochemical and plastics industry in Alberta. And that started right around 1950. Selenese was the first, um, AT Plastics came right after that. They built a, an entire industry in Red Deer and there was a bunch of chemical plants in Fort Saskatchewan. And that all had to do with cheap gas and lots of gas. Employees and contractors saw the importance of Selenese in providing local employment opportunities. Many considered Selenese to be a good place to work and feel that they were treated well for the most part. That's one of the things we learned about Selenese. Work can be fun. I mean, you're there to pr perform a duty and a service, but it, you can have fun doing it. It's no disrespect to the company if you have happy employees. And that's what it came down to. Develop a highly skilled workforce and use them properly. And don't be scared of a union because they've got some representation. Work with it. The plant was really important to the operations people and uh, you know, the people that worked year-round in the plant, but it was, I guess I could say, almost equally as important to the building trades people, because it provided that, uh, that amount of work right at home for, for all trades people that wanted to be at home, and it was uh, that important to the community. While Selenies was considered a good place to work, many employees were critical of management practices, particularly those related to occupational health and safety and the plant's impact on the environment. For the most part, it was staffed reasonably. It was just sort of near the end or near the last five years or seven years where it was uh, run with way less uh, people than would, would normally have, have been there. And I was just lucky that we never killed or, or hurt anyone too severely. I mean, in that time, we must have had five or six explosions slash fires. Right? I was on the fire crew. Management never really were held accountable, you know, as far as I could see. I remember once I walked out, we were starting up and they wanted to bypass safety protocols and I looked at the boss and I said, well, I'm leaving them. And they said, well, you can't. And I said, I'm not going to be here starting a time bomb. That's the end of that. And these other guys will all come with me and that's the end of this. And so the manager had to back down because he knew he was wrong. When we cleaned our vessels, I mean, in a process like this, just a lot of dirt, a lot of contamination, waste. What are we going to do with all this waste? So they had a big dugout just by the riverbank and the truck every morning would take tons and tons of this stuff and dump it in this dugout. This stuff was contaminated with lots of benzene, it was a lot of acid, it was a lot of solvents. There was years and years and years of it was dumped there on the riverbank. You know, this stuff is starting to leach into the river. Twin Bridges Sand and Gravel had their gravel pit just uh, got to the plant site and, you know, they're digging gravel and what the heck is this black stuff coming out of the ground? Sure as heck is no oil, that's for sure. Well, it, where they checked it, well, it's stuff coming from Selenese, from their, you know, their big dugout, that's where it's leaching. 
So now what? So Selenius turns around and buys out the twin bridge of sand and gravel, the whole area, because it's all contaminated. We had uh, holding ponds in the back for, right. and those ponds, they're, I don't know what was in there. They were supposedly lined, but they, they leached. But the chemicals in there, they're open to atmosphere, right? They're great big ponds, you know, a few million gallons in each pond. You'd see everything get wiped out instantly, almost the fish and any life. And also in the ponds, you'd see ducks or geese flying over. If they were too close to the water, they never got across. The hazardous potential of chemical spills meant that no worker at Selenese could ever breathe completely easy, literally and figuratively. Things like formaldehyde are really quite nasty uh, things to be around inhaling and stuff. And so there were masks of various kinds. And you, because that's the only way you could work in proximity with this stuff, you tended to use them. But no one was telling you you had to wear protective equipment. So I would say health and safety at that time was pretty lax. As a chemical plant and as a 50-year-old chemical plant, you know, you're certainly going to have the whole gamut. I mean, asbestos exposure, um, uh, various chemicals that over time, you know, at one time were viewed as safe and now are, you know, through uh, more evidence or whatever, or more exposures, I guess, pe people find out that, you know, there's nasty stuff there. A fella that worked in Xanthates, we worked seven day shifts where you worked for seven days, had days off, and then seven afternoons, days off, seven nights, days off. And he would work those days and he'd get sores all around his nose from the xanthates. And then on his four days off, he'd clear up and be better. The xanthate plant was very unstable, very reactive. Stuff, would, you look at it cross-eyed and it would burn blow up on you, oh yeah, it was wicked stuff. It was a wicked, wicked product to work with. I should know, I walked in Christmas Eve, 1971. Two hours later, I was at Royal Lake Hospital. Uh, I got blown out of the building, we had an explosion. Three of us actually got blown right out of the building. And I had, uh, I was off work for a few months. I had first and second degree burns in my face. For workers in the cigarette tow department, the risk of injury was an everyday experience. Most of the workers in that department, the company's most profitable area, were women. So the women working in the, in the fiber and the, and the uh, cigarette tow areas were, there were greater numbers of sort of injuries in those areas. Partly because of the kind of work they did in the fiber area, they'd be changing spindles on machines while they're still running and, and threading things through treadles and of various kinds and just the, the kind of job that required you to put your fingers in harm's way as a routine thing. And there were many, many women working with the yarn. Their dexterity and the work that they had to do these weighed up to five pounds each, and they would have to move them around with big trolleys. It was amazing to watch the ladies, how they had to doff or take the bobbins off the machines in time with a little chain that ran along. And of course, the chain was speeded up all the time, so they had to work harder and faster. In the lab, we worked with chemicals with absolutely no safety as we know it now. And the union got involved. It increased the safety and the health of the workers. Employment at Selenese was, for the most part, of a relatively high quality with good benefits, requiring technical skills and knowledge, and reasonably well paid. Much of the work was done in-house. Several workers mentioned challenging aspects, however. At that time we were working uh, eight-hour shifts, so it, and it was, a, it was shift work. So the worst part about eight-hour shifts is that you would work seven days in a row, and then you would get time off, and then another seven days. You, you got very few days off, because you spent most of those days recovering from night shift, it was really vexatious. I'd worked a few years and had stopped to have a child. And in those days, Selenese didn't want the women working past five months because they didn't want 
the flowing smocks we wore in those days and such things. It was too dangerous near the machinery. Of course, some of them would hide it and wear more. Now, at my time, tent dresses were in where you just wore a loose flowing dress, so that hit it easy for us, and it was the the wardrobe of the day, so it was sort of okay. We were given maternity leave, but no money of any shape or form, no unemployment, nothing. I acquired a, a, a repetitive strain injury, but a, also a sort of a repetitive trauma injury uh, based on, because of the physical nature of the job I was doing with the, the various uh, wrist movements and the impacts into your hands. Typical company, they then, you know, they'll pull you off and then, uh, so I was on sort of light duties and I was writing manuals for, for various jobs mm -hmm. and, you know, they, every week I'd get the same question, you know, is it getting better, is it getting better, or try this, right, or try that. The union was credited for providing health and safety, good benefits and security, and finally a healthy severance package. Th that company tried to fire me. Uh, there was, you know, they made they made no bones about it. Uh, the union definitely, definitely uh, saved my job. Because if you're just by yourself, and let's say a manager hates you for some reason, you know, it happens. Without the union, they can make your life, you know, living hell really at work. Whereas the union, though. They, you got the cloud of the whole plant site. Sony's was very good with safety. If I said, no, I'm not doing that job, we would talk to the union, the union would come in, and, and if they said, no, you know, it was not done. We got the plant manager to put in writing that uh, no disciplinary action would be issued uh, once the final investigation started. That would free up the person, you know, involved in the incident to say what they needed to say to get the safety improved. The Americans just flipped out when they found out about this. You know, what do you mean you can't fire the person? I think the biggest gain we made for our members, in 1987, the company came to us and they re redid the pension plan. I didn't belong to the pension plan because I thought it was a crappy plan. They changed it, which was somewhat equitable. We made a decision as a union that all the members should join this. What they needed is something when they retire. We got 97% of the people joined the pension plan. Basically, when, we, when, when I got involved with it, I didn't know, and I thought, oh, I heard union, it's, you know, it's, yeah, it's bad, it's bad, it's bad. It's, it's, you know, it's, oh, it's a communist thing. And it wasn't until I started getting into it, and then I realized, you know, this isn't so bad. We're representatives for a group of people. And that's what I had to start telling the people, say, I'm not the union, you guys are. The social and community side was viewed as one of the most attractive features of their work at Salonese. Employees and families lived in the same areas and socialized with each other. Many Salonese workers became actively involved in their communities, in their unions, and in local and provincial politics. I found it one of the most uh, friendliest uh, places to work. We had a huge uh, maintenance department, almost 200 uh, people employed in the maintenance department. It was a very close-knit group. They had baseball tournaments, they had children's picnics, they had Christmas parties, they had curling leagues, and uh, it was a lot of interaction off the job. And he was, yeah. He was working there in, the, in one of the buildings that I was assigned to work in at the time, and as it would turn out, we would both end up at the Edmund District Labour Council. Teddy Wozniak, of course, would go on to become a city councillor, and he became an MLA for the New Democrats. That is one of the benefits of having a plant like that, where you can be at home and you can take part in the community. There was nothing in this province that went on without something from CEP Salonese. I think the, the impact of Salonese as a unit on uh, the labor movement in this province is huge. I, and, and, you know, I mean, just on the fact that there's 50 years of labor history there, plus um, some very, very, a uh, very active core group of activists coming out of there. Here in uh, Alberta, uh, we had a classic example how uh, Canadian and provincial policy has uh, failed the citizens of Alberta. Uh, but directly failed uh, the CEP and our members. Uh, it's a long history of um, not taking care of the resources um, in the province. Natural gas pipeline, 
built uh, from uh, northern British Columbia through Alberta to Chicago to draw natural gas. It was called the Alliance Pipeline. Up until Lougheed's day, probably Getty's day, the feedstocks for, to feed the petrochemical industry in this province were stripped off before the gas went into that pipeline. Well, under Klein's government, they ended that. Pure raw natural gas is now going to Illinois in that Alliance Pipeline. It increased Selenese's costs by over a million dollars a month. The politicians decided it was better to fuel the American economy than to have industrial jobs in Canada and Alberta. The shutdown of the plant had little to do with its own profitability. It certainly wasn't because of the union or the, or the employees, because they were dedicated, loyal employees, and I'll tell you what, our productivity comparing to the U.S. was way higher per man. Up until right the last day we uh, shut the place down, uh, was making money. Even when Selenese, when Fibers closed, if for a long running time, Selenese was always the cash cow for other ventures that they had in the company. And when, when it come, push comes to shove and ventures with China and everything else, they never invested that money back into Selenese Canada. They took it and put it elsewhere. Making a profit's not a criteria anymore, it's making more profit. And in, uh, in terms of, of Selenese, they made cigaretto, which is the stuff that you make filters out of. And then all of a sudden they said uh, most of the cigaretto was going to China. And then they decided, well, we can build a plant in, in China and uh, use cheap labor. And we don't need this nice little old plant in Edmonton, so we'll close it down. The initial stages of this wind down were evident to employees who also noted distinct change in management approaches. The morale in the plant in the 2000, and from that point on, the morale was just ugly. I mean, the units were being shut down, people were being relocated, nothing was being told. Actually, that was part of, big, other than telling us that they were restructuring, they never actually told us what was going on. They basically gutted the union and overrode the contracts. Well, what I started to notice was uh, uh, they lied to us. <laughs> This bottom line, they, they, they would tell us how great the, everything was going. Uh, we would set goals uh, uh, to accomplish certain, uh, like say, say a safety standard. I'll use that as an example. The Yankees wanted us to have a certain safety standard, okay? So we, we beat that safety standard and came in below it with regards to incidences and uh, mishaps, near misses and all this kind of crap. And then... Uh, we didn't get recognized for it because they said they said that they didn't set it low enough. It was a slow death. It was like a like a, a, a disease that just started itself uh, uh, maybe in 1996 and then finally coming to to an end in uh, 07. We had people coming up from the head office in Dallas stating that there could be some problems down the road and we may have to uh, choose between one or two sites which unit we close down. Edmonton being one of those uh, sites on the sort of the hit list. So we rose to the occasion, car you know, deeply carved out that budget and, and met that challenge and yet they would come up again and say that's not enough. Uh, unfortunately uh, um, we're going to have to take that unit down and uh, in order to save money, uh, you know, as, as, as the company as a whole globally needs to, needs to take that unit down. So that was kind of the, kind of the beginning of it all and, and we really, at the time, we really felt betrayed. The actual shutdown of the Edmonton Selenese plant took place at the hands of Blackstone, a private equity fund. We were bought, you know, three, four times over the years. We changed names and everything, but everything was fine. Like, nothing really changed. But this last time we were bought out by this company called Blackstone, and they were a holding company, and they basically bought us to dissect us. They didn't care about the people whatsoever. That's the other thing I found out. They always told you we were the best commodity Selenies ever had. Well, they slashed people out of their door without a blink of the eye. Blackstone Incorporated is a big trust fund in the U.S. It has some of the most powerful people in the world uh, on its board of directors. When it came to the purchase of Selenies, they did what they've done in other instances where they will take a hard look at the, the economics of it. They will sell off uh, huge bits of it to other, to other companies, shut down uh, different sections of it. And they, uh, interestingly enough, as part of that process, 
uh, paid themselves $70 million in consulting fees to come in and break up the company as well. The people who built uh, the original Selenese plant back in the 1950s had a vision that they were building uh, a company, they were here to stay for the long term. The type of uh, company that Blackstone Incorporated is, is is not about actually building up a company and, mm -hmm. and, and making things. It's about uh, having capital assets that they can flip and sell off and they don't really care what happens to the community, they're just in it for a fast buck. If there was actually a, a, a Canadian energy plan that supported our petrochemical industry, mm -hmm. that made it much more worthwhile for these companies to stay here in Alberta, mm -hmm. then you wouldn't necessarily see these companies coming in and, and uh, just shutting them down. The closure of the plant resulted not only in job loss, but also loss of community and of workers' ability to contribute to their community. We went through so much, kids, divorces, uh, people, you know, retiring, everything else, and, and seeing, watching people grow and, and, and watching their families grow and everything else, it, you're going to miss the whole community aspect. You're looking at, at 4,000 people who lost their jobs mm -hmm. and a significant income, mm -hmm. and if you start make, turning that into terms of families, you know, you're talking maybe 12,000 people. And you know, so now they're not taking a bigger role in their communities. They're not able to. Even if you just look at the amount of money over the years that they generated for the United Way, money that they put into building the recreation center in Sherwood Park, and that's the thing. Uh, we made good money there, but we spent the money in our communities. And so uh, the tax base and the, and the uh, consumer spending was, I think, uh, very important to Edmonton, and, uh, and it's sad that it's gone. Our guys are talking to me today about we had this osteoporosis program where a guy cycled across the country and we raised a million dollars. They like that today. They, they remember that more than any wage increase, you know, what you've done for society, in effect. People are socially conscious, if you like, if you allow them to be. Part of that, the Energy and Chemical Workers Union can take a lot of credit for it because that's what we felt the union was all about. The union movement has to be a social movement as much as an economic movement. Workers haven't changed much in the sense that they want to be proud of their job, they want to be proud of their employer, they want to be proud of their union.